When I think back to high school, I remember those cliques. There were the jocks, the band geeks, the anime nerds, the guys who played hacky sack in the courtyard and a hundred other groups with obscure identities. But every now and then, there was that special someone who transcended cliques, someone who could defy the laws of teenage social hierarchy. At my school, it was a girl named Allie. She had that unique ability of being at home with the jocks and the nerds and the band geeks, and even hung out with the guys playing hacky sack in the courtyard. Unsurprisingly, she was also our class president. And that's because there's this immense power in being the person who can act as the go-between between between multiple groups. And that's something we heard from today's guest. Lissa Mishka Allen is the vice president and global head of marketing and digital at Hinduja Global Solutions. On our interview, she talked about being a nerd translator. She's that person who can help the more technical-minded people and the more business-minded people really understand one another. And I think that's something that all great leaders are able to do. They're able to understand technical people well enough to get what they're saying and translate it into actionable insights. And I think that's something that every data professional needs to keep in mind. It's not enough to understand the insights, you have to be able to translate it into the language that everyone understands. And when you can do that, you can unlock massive opportunities. So with that, let's get into it. Welcome to Truth Be Known. So welcome everyone to another episode of Truth Be Known. We have a really special guest today. I love when I get to interview people with a a marketing background too, and we get to nerd out on all sorts of fun digital transformation things. Welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much, Lauren. I'm really excited to have a chat with you. Awesome. I'd love to kick off with, how did you get started in marketing? You know, basically by accident. I would play basketball in college, thought I was going to play in the WNBA, suddenly realized that was not actually going to happen for my 5'9 self and uh, (laughs) was like, well, what else do I love? And that was magazines. So I got into journalism. We all know that doesn't really pay that well. Uh, And by sheer luck of timing, I'm one of those exennials, the cuspers that sort of grew up with technology. So it felt like as new ways of putting content online were growing up, so was I, right? So I was like web blogging when it was called web blogging as opposed to blogging. Yeah. And I like met the founders of Twitter at South by Southwest the night before they announced Twitter and was on Instagram when there were like two people on it. It was really boring and I didn't use it for another like two years. Right. So like my whole career has been um, charting with technology. And so at some point content and technology converged into doing content marketing for technology companies. And then I was really excited to hear you talk about us, you know, getting ready to nerd out because that's one of the places in which I've found differentiation is sort of I build myself as a nerd translator. No apologies to the nerds because I consider myself one, but kind of, you know, working that line between technology and what normal people need to hear in order to understand what's going on in, in the tech world. Now that's that's awesome. I feel like you and I have probably been in the same room over the years, but not, <laughs> not met before. Of the so I I started in in marketing very sort of serendipitously as well as completely unintentional and I needed a job and health insurance and then all of a sudden I was doing paid search but before <laughs> paid search was socially acceptable and anyone right. knew what it was and when you say you work on things on the internet people think you know all sorts of nefarious mm-hmm. back alley work where now yeah. it's it's what we all do I worked for a website called Endless beauty. And I have to say beauty very, very carefully because that's what people thought. Endless yeah. booty. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, my first job on the, my first job on the internet was working at an online dating site. Ooh. And, and now, you know, online dating is very, very productive. ubiquitous. Yeah. Bumble just had an amazing IPO. Oh yeah. When I worked in online dating, this was the, oh, you're dating online that's creepy (laughs) and now it's it's how people date so it was it was very very similar where where do you work I think I used to tell people I was a bartender versus I work at an online dating (laughs) because this was probably 20 years ago (laughs) Um, I you know how things have changed now I wish now I wish I was that early employee at Bumble (laughs) 
<laughs> I know, right? That's an Austin-based company, um, which is where I'm based. So a little hometown pride for me. So can you tell me a little bit about the work you've been doing uh, in the last few years? Yeah, it's a little, it's been a little bit of everything. <laughs> uh, and I would say like, if you look for a common thread between everything that you and I have both done, as I'm beginning to understand, you're just looking at how you tell stories, right? So like the people that we're working with, whether it's a, a <laughs> early dating site and they're trying to address fears, or if it's automation or AI and also trying to address fears of robots taking over, right? It's how you're telling stories. So I've been telling stories for a call center company or a software development firm, or right now with HGS Digital, we do a lot of innovation, digital transformation. So what does a modern customer experience look like and how do you tell that story? Because we have these incredible smart men and women putting in like algorithms and doing this great automation and they're focused on that and they're not they're not focused on what that means for the end user, for the customer, for the business. Right. And so it's, it's, I've been pulling out those threads, which is really fun. It, it gets back to that like journalistic roots, you know? Totally. And there's this really interesting psychology behind it of sort of digging into, digging into people's stories. Absolutely. We'd interviewed someone on the podcast, um, recently had this, we asked a question about, um, you know, how long have you been working in data? And he's like, I've been working in data my entire life, everything is data, data is storytelling. And so much of how he thought about data and thought about this was, it's not that you one day you look at a spreadsheet and all of a sudden you're making data driven decisions. It's how you interact with people. It is the narratives we tell are all based on different forms of data and information. I love it. Absolutely. Because data is just another lens to look at in order to identify what you're looking at. Completely. And it's, I think, how our rational minds start to put everything in boxes of, here's all of these different pieces of information that I'm pulling together. Now this is what's going to make sense here. Yeah. Well, it's funny. This summer I was consulting with a data science company who like was talking to leaders at all of the big CPG companies and, and big brand names. And everybody is saying, no longer are we looking for like, where's our data or what's our data. We're trying to figure out what in the world to do with this data and how like we're promised all these insights, but like, how do we pull them out? How do we get them? How do we take action based on what we know? And so that's the that sort of like, you know, a bit of translation or understanding or storytelling is like, what story is this data giving me? Right. And then how you said this really well earlier, but how do you use data in your life right now, in your career right now? How do you see all of this pulling through to your your day to day job? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, we're certainly not perfect in terms of being able to pull all of our disparate sources of data together and, and make incredible data-driven decisions, right? I mean, nobody is, so <laughs> we're not alone in that challenge. Um, but we, I mean, that's definitely something that we're working on. But I also think data is really interesting because um, you can kind of use it to inform decisions for sure, but also kind of validate and verify instincts, right? So like, I'm someone, and you probably are too, who goes a lot off of instinct. I think this is the right thing to do. That set, that feels right. My gut says that's right, whatever. And instinct is also, you know, a, kind of a code word for experience. Like that didn't come just from me, like oh, <laughs> choosing it. Completely. I have this running joke with my my team every time I've presented it. And they're like, are you going to rehearse? Are you going to practice? How much are you going to do? And I went, not really. I'm probably just going to wing it. And someone on my team corrected me at one point. He's like, you're not winging this. You've been doing this for 20 years. You stopped winging this a long time ago. This is based <laughs> on you've done this a thousand times. Exactly. Yeah. And then, and so I think c data can help you kind of verify your assumptions, vet your own assumptions, but it can also, for someone who's earlier in their career, younger, hasn't done it a thousand times, maybe only done it 200 like help fill in some of the gaps. And so you say, I think this is right, but I'm not sure what to do about this element of it. And data can help fill that gap in for you. Absolutely. And I think data helps shape a lot of the decisions that we make. And it's the the trust, but verify. What's the information exactly. I need? What's the information I need to look at? How do I make sure what I have is, this is my instinct and this is my experience, but you know what? If I don't have the right information to back this up, like what am I going to do here? Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of questions around data purity and like, are you getting the right data? And then how are you manipulating the data? And to some extent, you can make data say anything you want it to if, you, if you're good enough at it. Right. <laughs> so you want to be careful that especially like as a marketer, what you're pulling out is not 
just like, okay, you know, that article got a thousand views. So I was right. We should sell that. That doesn't make sense necessarily. Like you're extrapolating a lot out of that one piece of data. But if you're saying, okay, well, X keyword drove those people, they have a specific business need that we're addressing, then you're actually getting value from data that you're pulling in that kind of scenario. Exactly. And then with all the data we have to look at as a marketer, how important is trusting your data and actually believing that it's real? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, you you have to trust your data and you have to believe it's real, right? What else do you have to go on? Um, no, but that is that does go back to like, where are you pulling it from? How much, how many different sources are you getting? Like you're not looking at a single source of truth in terms of one channel. So you can't trust just Google Analytics, right? Any, you're going to trust your power dot or whatever your marketing automation is. You're yeah. going to trust your email. Like you're going to look at a holistic picture and then with all of those sources of data have one single source of truth but that but one of those sources is not the, the end all be all or else you get myopic and i i completely agree with you and it's the if you only have one source of data if you're only looking at one thing one piece of the puzzle it's almost worse than having no data because that one thing you could say well all of my experience says do x but this data that I have says actually do Y, so I'm going to do Y. And it turns out you're looking at incomplete information. And then all of a sudden it's, I just, I had this earlier uh, in the early in my career of when I was doing paid search and it was, well, all of the data says this keyword generates the most amount of leads. This keyword doesn't de generate a lot. So let's put all of our money in this one keyword. And it was true. All that keyword generated a lot of leads. The data we were missing was what was actually turning to close deals, what was yep. turning to revenue. And you're sitting there going, this feels funny. I don't believe, like logically this doesn't make sense, but the data shows this. It turns out when we had a more complete data set, um, we would have lost a million dollars a year just in ad spend by following uh, what yeah. the complete data set spent. Mm -hmm. And this is like 2005 where a million dollars a year of internet spend is <laughs> insane. But people are still making that mistake in yeah. 2021. You know, like like people don't have that education or the understanding of how important the whole funnel view is or the whole data set view is, whatever your data set is, if it's not a funnel like ours. But <laughs> the, yeah, people are still kind of bumping up against themselves, trying to trust data and and almost putting like too much trust into it. Completely. And so much of this for me goes to the, if you don't have, if you don't have all of the data that you need and you're like, no, no, this is real. I buy into this. I'm not missing this one data source. And this isn't old. This isn't from three months ago because we know in a COVID world, three months ago is <laughs> irrelevant. Not, not relevant. It's like three months Next week is going to be different from this week. <laughs> and it's when, if you don't have everything, you just might as well just go on pure instinct because you're probably going to make the wrong decision. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> In your career, are there what have you done to define the culture of your organization? And are there ever times where you came in and dramatically wanted to change or adapt the culture of your team? Yeah. Um, so I was working at a, a BPO, which they historically have like a pretty terrible <laughs> reputation, honestly. They So it's call centers, high turnover. And so I was part of a new team, their first marketing department. And so my charge, I was leading all of our digital strategy. So social media, website, employee intranet. And I went into it with the mindset of like, okay, we're creating a people first culture, but we're not, for us, we're not going to like shove it down their throat. We're not going to tell them that we care about people when they're already on site caring about each other. They already, they're, so BPOs operate in, you know, so you have one corporate office in 62 call centers around the globe or around the US or whatever. So for us, and this is just a small example, but like we had individual Facebook pages that people at the call center sites had started and they were on there talking about their next pizza day or dress up day or who needed help with their kids or carpooling or whatever. Right. And so rather than like come in and say, Oh, we're corporate, we're going to shut those down, which is a reaction because there's like brand consistency and stuff like that to worry about. We came in and we're like, okay, 
these are awesome. This is what our culture is. This is our people taking care of each other, sharing what they're doing. Let's put some guardrails in place for them. Talk to them about what good social media usage is. Give them graphics, give them branding stuff, like give them the stuff, which then they feel even better about, right? Like, cause they're joining us in building the culture. And then we have like, we truly have a culture <laughs> where like, and it's not something we were like sitting in a boardroom, like, oh, we should make a culture now. <laughs> Which work. always is so effective. <laughs> right. So in, you know, in, in, uh, as a counterexample, I have been in a place where that, <laughs> where it, I, in an acquisition where that the company that I was with had a super strong culture, really smart, great, diligent people um, going into a culture that was not. And, and, and it was the, the kind of thing where, you know, you would go in and they would say, oh, we have a, a charitable giving initiative, a women's initiative, a this, that, and the other initiative. And that was where it stopped. And so they, that, that acquisition had a really hard time and had a lot of attrition because those, those people that love the culture at the company they were at when they got acquired, didn't feel supported, heard part of the culture that, wasn't really a culture anyway. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's a big miss because the people are ultimately what make the company successful. It, it really is. And I think a big takeaway for me within a lot of that is we define what the culture is and take the best of what's working and encourage people and the team mm-hmm. to keep going and developing. And it's really up to us as leaders to, to push and to protect that in a lot of ways. Yeah, absolutely. I think of it kind of, so you, we, as marketers, we've all heard like the whole, like, don't tell customers what your product features or service features are, right? Like address what the customer need is. And it's the same, I think, with building teams and building culture. Like, don't say like, hey, we want to make you a happier employee by having a cool initiative for you, right? You listen to the employee and then you say, hey, you have a need, which is, childcare, we're going to find a situation, a solution for you, whether it's a stipend, whether it's on site childcare, whatever it is. But I think it's the same principle that we apply in marketing. Completely, completely. And the, and thinking on the, the marketing side and sort of pivoting a little bit on topics, I, it's great to talk to another long-term digital marketer and long-term digital marketing expert and someone who really came up in that space. It's so strange thinking that we are the old timers in this space because I I personally don't feel like an old timer. No, me neither. (laughs) And you're like, but I met Jack Dorsey the day before he announced, Mm -hmm. which so many people can't imagine a world before social media. How do you see brands breaking through in digital awareness? How do you, what do you see the importance of data in the future of digital marketing? Very important. (laughs) That's a baseline. (laughs) Um, I think, I think the brands that are, are breaking through it and you, you touched on our ages, right? So I think that so there's something really interesting that's coming out of Gen Z and their whole direct to consumer, like no bullshit. Sorry. I don't know if I can cuss on this podcast. Um, <laughs> they're, they're uh, the Gen Z, like just straightforward, cut out the fat, the middleman, whatever approach. The, the brands that are succeeding are telling a story of how, what they do, their product, their service is impacting the consumer and it's resonating with them. And you can't make that up, right? Like if if your product isn't doing what you say it's going to do, Gen Z is going to find you out and blow you up on TikTok. But it's not just Gen Z. I mean, that resonates for me with a technical audience. I mean, like a CIO isn't going to go on TikTok and blow me up, but he's never going to buy from me again, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it is the authenticity and the relationships and what digital has done is part of it is giving us the scale. Mm -hmm. But the other piece of it is to your point, if you're not authentic, if this isn't real, it's very, very easy for your customers to call you out on that. Yeah. Yeah. But then going back to the data, it's, it's, Interesting too, because I, like it also raises the bar for the customer expectation in terms of what I should what what a company should already know about me. A company should know that I'm not pregnant and I don't need ads for baby clothes. 
Do you remember when Target had that big thing? Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> it told a bunch of women they were pregnant when they weren't. Um, <laughs> and to the, the shock and dismay of all of us going, what do you know that I don't know? <laughs> exactly. Like, so that's data gone wrong. But as I think as we move forward, the ability to shape the customer journey and like make it seamless and frictionless and smoother for the customer through the data that you have on them is a welcomed addition to the digital landscape. I think then that authenticity becomes really important because personalization can be really, really cheesy if it's not truly personal, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you don't really know me, it's not good. <laughs> if you really know me, amazing. I'm buying whatever you're selling in like three seconds off Instagram. <laughs> yes. yes. And so one of the things you had mentioned is sort of the, when you were talking about CIOs as customers, and it, there's, I find as digital becomes more and more prominent in the over, in marketing, there's a lot of overlap between marketing and IT now. Yeah. Um, I would love your perspective on how do you work with IT? How do you see the role of a head of marketing and a head of IT just converging in a lot of ways? I love, there's a stat that, and I don't, I don't know it, so I won't lie to you, but some percentage of CIOs or CTOs are people coming from marketing now. Um, like who came really? up with like, yeah, like some notable percentage, talk about data, some statistically significant percentage is non zero <laughs> number yeah, is coming up from a, like a marketing track into the CIO role. And I think that's, you know, MarTech is obviously a huge part of it. Data science is a huge part of it. You've got to have that like left brain, left brain, right brain ability to flip between the two in order to be successful, like a pure brand experiential marketer is is kind of niche now instead of having the like breadth of skills that a you know a digital marketer has it it really is and if i think of the the skill sets of people on my team could easily in some places especially marketing operations flip flop and could be in it and can sit in can sit in a marketing department and I think, I can't remember, again, another statistic that I remember directionally, but not exact. This is why I'm in marketing, not finance. Directionally is one of my favorite marketing terms ever. <laughs> directionally accurate. Um, exactly. With the, the uh, you know, was, I think it was Forrester of the CMO will spend more money on technology than the CIO. And yeah. it, it's true. It's what we, it's what we buy. And marketing is so led by technology and that relationship between mm -hmm. Marketing and IT is so important. Yeah. Yeah. And to go back to your other question about sort of how do you work with IT, I think a lot of marketers are like, frankly, just really scared of IT, which makes no sense. <laughs> like they're these big, scary people in their basements coding and like they're so much smarter and like oh, there's all these insecurities and like I don't understand technology. I can barely turn on my computer or like whatever historically, stereotypically in marketing. Yes. And I think you got to shed all of that. Like you can, you're smart. You can figure it out. You can talk tech. <laughs> and it's, it's funny that you say that of, you know, this misconception of IT is like hidden in the basement and the way you're describing it. I went, that's what I did when I started in digital marketing. It was the, oh no, these are the web people. Mm -hmm. They like sit in a back room somewhere and don't get out in the sunlight. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, not untrue, not true. There's a, a combination in between. Sure. <laughs> sort of stereotypes that people have in their head and the roles of technical marketers and the roles of IT really start to coincide. And the I per, outside of maybe a CFO who needs data and numbers all the time, I don't believe there is a more an organization that is more data driven and more reliant on data and numbers than the marketing organization. Absolutely. And that's, a, but that's like a relatively new trend. So I think that's why it's scary to some marketers is because we, I mean, marketing ops didn't even exist until like five years ago, right? Like <laughs> <laughs> you would think that marketers as creative, agile, you know, excited, interesting people, which is like personality traits of us would be excited about the pace of change and new tools and techniques and all that kind of stuff. But there's just something about, like the, the data or the technology that's like a little bit scary, which I just would like encourage all marketers to like forget that 
and dive in. It, it is the lean into the change. We've been leaning into change. We, yeah. are, we are the department in any company that leans into change. That's like, let me try this new thing. Mm -hmm. But with, with data, it is the most important thing for all of us. And we shouldn't be scared of it. And maybe people are scared because what, what, what are they going to find out? But it's the knowledge is power. And the more we know, the better decisions we make, the more strategic and important the role of marketing is. And I think again, to the, the things we want to be perceived as marketers and the things CIOs and IT people want to be perceived as like, no, I am strategic. What I do, I don't carry a bag. The CIO doesn't carry a bag, but what we do adds meaningful revenue to the business. And we're in, and <laughs> tell me with editing. Um, and so much of what we do ties into driving meaningful revenue for the business. And if we don't have that connection to data, if we don't have also the relationship with the IT organization, this is when everything starts to suffer. Absolutely. I have gotten so many things done on time that I should not have gotten done on time because of good relationships with people in IT. <laughs> Oh, a hundred percent where it's, Hey, MJ, can you do me a solid? <laughs> <laughs> I know you've already worked a lot, but <laughs> we're, we're sort of stuck right here. And if you can help me out, I'll help you out. <laughs> and it's even things like where so much of the overlap is, okay, does marketing own domains or does IT own domains? Domains. Don't even get me started. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is like, well, Yes, yeah. both either. <laughs> Depends on who bought it, but IT is definitely administering it, but I definitely need it as a marketer. I need like, it, but can it be your budget, not my budget? You administer, <laughs> but I run. But if it's a corporate purchase and it's this this constant overlap that I, I, I think both of us at some point may be CIOs based on this and the CIO is listening <laughs> to the podcast and going, can we be marketers? That sounds like fun. <laughs> right? <laughs> Well, and I do love that. I, I, from a culture perspective, it's funny. I like marketing teams have, and we were talking about stereotypes, but we also have the stereotype of being like the fun, energetic, like bringing the party to the corporation. Right. And it's true. Like you don't want to lose that. But I think that if you were just a stereotype personality types, like IT doesn't always have that. But what I've found is that they will 100% appreciate it. So if you can continue being fun and funny and yourself and just like trust that the IT guy's laughing in the background, even though you can't see him, you will be so much better and build so much better relationships. <laughs> it is. And it is the, the, especially the marketers that I have on the team that are the most technical, spend the most time with our IT team yeah. trying to figure out new technology stacks. And this is what we're, this is what we're thinking about. So it is that, if you build that part of the relationship and we always talk about marketing and sales and marketing and product, but it is that overlap between marketing and it that is the underpinning of so much of what we do. Absolutely. It's, it's why I wanted to be that sort of nerd translator. Right. So like yeah. I understand enough to be dangerous. I understand enough to break things like that, but I understand enough to build relationships because I value your contribution to the business. And that's what, you know, all relationships are kind of built on. A hundred percent. So my, my favorite part of truth be known of one of my favorite parts of truth be known is um, our quick air questions. So these okay. are questions you have to answer quickly. Um, shall we go? Yeah, let's do it. All right. What is a talent or skill that's not on your resume? Painting. Really? What do you it think? Surprised, it surprised even me. It's actually like a, it came out of COVID last year. <laughs> nice. I learned to drive. You became a painter. Yeah, absolutely. So you are, what other people might not know about you is you are a multi-sport athletic star. Um, absolutely. What is your greatest moment as an athlete? Oh, there's so many. Being an athlete so fun. I played a charity football game called Blondes versus Brunettes. We were down and there was like, I don't know, 12 seconds left in the game. It's raining. This is like epic. And uh, I went to, I was a quarterback. I went to throw a touchdown pass, 
receiver wasn't open, ran the ball into the end zone and did a dive, like epic TV camera. There was none, but TV camera dive into the end zone. <laughs> that was awesome. But the best part is there's a photo of me hitting the end zone and the other team's coach. The look of horror on his face is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. That is kind of amazing. Um, you are a digital marketing aficionado, sort of intersection of IT and marketing, a painter, and I'm going to say I'm going to say world class world class athlete. I'm wow! Athlete. <laughs> so yeah, one of our, just I'm, walking contradiction, you know. <laughs> you know what? Life is too boring any other way. Exactly. <laughs> Um, if you were in a tech, if you were in a digital marketer, what, what would you be doing? Oh, I don't know. Um, being a painter, playing in the WNBA, running a travel company, which would have absolutely tanked last year. You could have come up with the virtual alternative travel to keep it's everyone true. excited. It's true. Um, I think we are all desperate to go outside and get on a plane again soon. Oh, this is my favorite question. Oh, it's always so interesting. What is the book, podcast, TV show? What have you been binging recently? Oh, this is horrible. Uh, <laughs> Bridgerton, so, no. <laughs> oh, yeah, loved Bridgerton. Um, no, so I'm a huge fan of all the Chicagos. Like, so sh Chicago PD, Chicago Med, Chicago Fire, even Chicago JD when it was a thing. I've been to the city once. I just, I love them. It's like my nighttime soap opera. <laughs> You know what? We all work so much. You need something to turn your brain off. <laughs> I know, but I feel like I disappoint people because they expect me to have something like amazing that they should also watch. And they're like, no, I'm not watching your stupid Chicago shows. <laughs> it's it's okay. When people ask me that, I was like, I'm really reading a book series about magic right now. So Ooh. pretty sure nobody wants to read the series about magic because <laughs> I think it's awesome, but none of you care. And that's totally fine. I am, I am reading a book about called, uh, I think it's called Numeracy. So it's like how, as, kind of touching on what we were talking about earlier, but how uh, as a nation, like we, none of us really understand numbers and like the, how big numbers actually are and all that kind of thing. So sort of like illiteracy, it's innumeracy. That's the name of the book, which is really interesting, but same kind of reaction. <laughs> um, I, I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. And I completely believe that. And I also don't think humans can understand time and the concept of time. Oh. We just, we can't. We cannot understand. No, we're both exploding head emojis right now. Okay. Uh, last question is, what is the piece of advice you would give yourself 10 years ago? Oh, it's such a hard one. I'm, I'm just like not an advice giver. Um, so I like, I guess I would just have to say like, Hey, you are making the right choices. You are making the right decisions. Like the, whatever you're doing might, especially like for me, it might not fit like what the societal or normal path looks like, but that is the absolute right decision for you. And um, yeah, you're doing the right things. I know you said you're not an advice giver. I think that is advice everyone could use today as well. Chill out. You're doing the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I try to make sure I tell myself that too. <laughs> I, I do too, and I'm gonna I'm going to remember that this is your advice, which I'll be more likely to take versus my own advice. Uh, this has been an absolute absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We have to have you back, and we'll do a a marketing and data roundtable one day. Oh, that'd be awesome! Thanks so much for having me. It's been so much fun. Truth be known is brought to you by Talent, a leader in data integration and data integrity. Talent enables every company to find clarity amidst the chaos. Talent Data Fabric brings together in a single platform all the necessary capabilities that ensure enterprise data is complete, clean, compliant, and readily available to everyone who needs it throughout the organization. Learn more at talent.com. That's T-A-L-E-N-D.com.